Number 10, Craven the Spider Hunter. We know on Earth 8 there is a spider woman who happens to resemble Craven somewhat, but did you know that on Earth 31 there actually is a Sergei Kravinov who simply is Spider Man? Yep, Craven is known as Hunter Spider, who after being exposed to a giant spider's spider venom while hunting a lion in Zimbabwe, became himself a spider themed hero. Hunter Spider specifically focuses on hunting spider themed villains in New York City. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, if you love it when we talk about alternate spider folks, be sure to let us know by clicking that subscribe button. I know there's a bunch of you out there that aren't subscribed, and if that's who you are, Maybe subscribe. It's a nice thing to do. Helps us out. Number nine, Spider. S P D R R P D R R. Penny Parker's story is really just strange. I mean, even her superhero name is pretty strange. S P slash slash D R. Penny Parker hails from the reality of Earth 14512. Here she pilots a mech that is connected to her through her genes and a spider bite. The spider bite connects her to the suit, as the spider that bit her actually makes up half of the mech suit known as Spider's CPU. In her alternate reality, she also has a rival in Addie Brock, who ends up as the pilot of the mech suit known as Venom, or as it's spelled there, V-E-N hashtag M, or pound sign, if you prefer. Penny is weird in the sense that a lot of her story, while still echoing the canon, feels like such a fresh take on the origin of Spider-Man, which is also why I love it. Number eight, the spider. On Earth 15, Spider-Man is the exact opposite of a hero. He is a villain, a criminal, and one of the most extreme kinds of criminals, a serial killer. He merged with a symbiote that is basically carnage to become the spider. His sense of humor is extremely dark and he actually takes joy in hurting others. Despite joining the Time Breakers, the spider later tries to take over multiple different universes and ends up being killed during his attempt. So while he is really creepy and disturbing, at least he's gone now. Or at least he's gone for now. The spider was one of the characters and teammates that appeared in Exiles, making his first appearance in the 2000 and one Exile series in issue number 12, but eventually was killed in issue number 44. While we know about Peter Parker and his role as the spider on Earth 15 as a serial killer with a symbiotic suit, we don't really know anything else about his home reality. So. Yeah, I wonder if all the other heroes are also villains there. Number seven, Spider Bite. I am so happy that I get to talk about Spider Bite. She was actually my favorite spider themed hero to appear in the Vault of Spiders comic. And she's also definitely a weirdo in the best of ways. She hails from a world where people actually spend most of their time online as avatars, which is pretty weird. Spider Bite is actually Margot's avatar, or one of them, rather, that she wears in the digital space. She fights to protect people in cyberspace by donning her spider by persona and apprehending cyber criminals. Seriously though, how cool would it be if we actually had a hero like this on, you know, the internet, on cyberspace? Although this might seem like a strange reality to some, the cool thing about Spider Bite is it kind of feels like she could exist in our own future. I mean, already people spend a lot of time online and we have things like VR, Oculus, and even digital land. So this could very well be our own future. Honestly, we maybe need some vigilantes on the internet. Number six. Mr. Mixelpidilic. Look, I talked about Batmite when discussing heroes, and he wasn't even really a hero. So how can I not mention the first fifth dimensional imp in this video? Plus he's got a fun name. Mr. Mixelpidilic is a reality warping imp obsessed with Superman, who just like his rival Batmite did with Batman, simply seeks to annoy the hell out of Superman and just prove he is smarter than him. Which is good, because he has a level of power that in other hands could cause the entire end of the multiverse. More on that later though. He can do almost anything imaginable if he wishes it. And his only weakness really is being convinced or tricked into saying his name backwards to send him back to the fifth dimension, which if you're trying to say it correctly is honestly a superpower in and of itself. Click, click, clitopazixum, 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 I got it. Mixopitalic, click. Number five, Emperor Joker. Mr. Mixelpidilic has an extreme level of power, like I said. Also, like I said, if this power fell into the wrong hands, it could be potentially reality ending. Now, what hands could be worse than the psychotic hands of Batman's arch nemesis, the Joker? Well, that's exactly who gets the power in the Emperor Joker storyline. Mr. Mix gets bored and wants to give Joker 1% of his power just to see the tricks Joker is able to pull 
off, but instead, the Joker tricks Mr. Mixopidilic into giving him 99.9% .9 of his power instead. Joker uses this power to rewrite all of reality to become his sick, twisted dream world. He eats the whole population of China out of a Chinese food container box. He keeps everyone stuck in a time loop, including Batman, who he introduces to the afterlife over and over every day forever. Oh, and he also turned Flash into a slow moving obese man. Superman, the Spectre, and Mr. Mixopidilic being the only ones who can remember the former world try to do something about this all powerful Joker. But that's just the problem. He is all powerful. He destroys all of reality, but he can't bring himself to destroy Batman fully. And because of this, he loses control of his power, allowing the Spectre and Mr. Mix to steal it back and fix all of reality. But this story is its pretty nuts. Number 4. Condiment King When the villainous Condiment King came on the scene, it was literally on the scene, as he appeared in the animated Batman TV show from 1992. One of the best, honestly. Condiment King was Buddy Stantler, a comedian who was brainwashed by the Joker into becoming a villain who wields condiment squirters and viciously horrible puns. I knew you'd catch up to me sooner or later. How I've relished this meeting. Come Batman, let's see if you can cut the mustard. Diabolical stuff like that. The puns get even worse in the comics with his real name becoming a pun on its own. Mitchell Mayo. He isn't taken seriously by anyone. His weapons don't actually project his condiments at a speed fast enough to do anyone harm, but they sure are inconvenient, leaving nasty stains in your superhero costume. On the other hand, he does potentially have the ability to be able to cause anaphylactic shock if he is battling someone with an allergy, right? Number 3. Monsieur Mala and the Brain Monsieur Mala is described in his wiki as <clears throat> a militant, super intelligent French gorilla. The brain, on the other hand, is described as a genius French scientist and master criminal who exists as a disembodied brain. So, those two descriptions are interesting enough on their own, but when I tell you the French militant gorilla and the disembodied brain are an item together, I think that just elevates the whole thing to a different level. Together, they are the primary leaders of the Brotherhood of Evil, who were villains to both the Doom Patrol and the Teen Titans. They both appeared in Doom Patrol 86 in 1964. Now, Brain was once a scientist who experimented on the gorilla who would become Mala, which would increase Mala's intelligence. An accident injured Ernst, and Mala had to remove Ernst's brain and place it in a technological holding thingy majig to keep him alive and be able to communicate. The two are almost always together, with Mala carrying around the brain. Hey look, I don't judge. You find love where you find love, but as a concept for supervillains who lead a team of supervillains, you gotta admit it's it's pretty odd to say the least. Number two, animal vegetable mineral man. Let me repeat that for all those in the back who may not have heard. Animal vegetable mineral man. I don't really have a problem with two thirds of that. I just get really hung up on the vegetable part. Is that weird? Sven Larsen is the man who claims that title. And while it is a completely ridiculous one, it is actually pretty fitting. Sven fell victim to an experiment of his own making, which allows him to transform into any animal, vegetable, or mineral, either partially or fully, although he very obviously likes to do a bit of all three at the same time, which is an odd choice, but hey, I just work here. Animal Vegetable Mineral Man first appeared in Doom Patrol 89 in August 1964, and he is an enemy to the team, which makes sense given their weirdness. But Animal Vegetable Mineral Man here has a vendetta against the Doom Patrol's leader, the Chief, who he believed once stole an invention of his. An invention that, funnily enough, is the only way of stopping Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. But he didn't even do that, so it, I don't know. Look, it gets weirder and weirder, but I gotta move on. Before I do though, Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. Okay, sorry, I just wanted to get out of my system one more time. <laughs> Number one, Mr. Mind. I think anyone who hasn't heard of this villain before would be forgiven. When you think of the most fearsome villains, specifically the villains of Captain Marvel, otherwise known as Shazam, you may not first think about the seven inch long sentient worm from Venus known as Mr. Mind. This diabolically evil mind controlling worm, after the events of Infinite Crisis, would cocoon himself and then emerge as a massive monstrosity capable of manipulating reality, consuming universes, and traveling through time and space. He was described as eating years and events from this universe's history, altering the earth with every flap of his wings. It took a combined effort from Booster Gold, Supernova, and Skeets to defeat Mr. Mind by trapping him inside Skeets' shell 
which was fortified by the suspendium. Then, Booster Gold threw Skeets through time with the help of Supernova to the day he was first discovered on Earth by Dr. Savannah, and then he is trapped in a time loop forever. So they didn't even actually end up like ending him. They just trapped him. This all powerful mind controlling 7 inch long worm. At number 10 is the punch dimension. This probably wins the award for the most uncomfortable and painful universe on this list, unless you're Cyclops, in which case it's actually probably the most useful, but still pretty painful I'd imagine. In fact, the punch dimension is where Cyclops gets all of his power from. Because instead of him actually generating all his power from within, his eyes are actually known to be doorways to this dimension, which he can summon kinetic energy out of on command. But if anyone else were to travel there, they'd probably die immediately. Honestly, Cyclops probably would too. To think that there's just a dimension out there that consists of pure concentrated kinetic energy and nothing else is definitely bizarre if not terrifying. At number 9 is Marvel Noir. On Earth 90214, all of the most popular heroes get their own retellings through the lens of the 1920s and 1930s era. And although I think this is a really cool idea, some of the characters that get their own noir makeovers just come off as a bit bizarre. A few of them give me that uncanny feeling where I can't tell whether the steampunk aesthetic is really cool for them or just doesn't work as smoothly as others, like the noir Iron Man or the pirate portrayal of Namor. But overall, we do end up with Spider-Man Noir who has become a well-known alternate version of the hero, especially after being voiced by Nicolas Cage in the Into the Spider-Verse animated film. Don't get me wrong, I actually think this universe is really cool, but it's also very weird, hence why it's made it onto this list. At number eight, we have the Pocket Universe. This one is definitely a bizarre concept that really puts things into perspective on and off the page. Franklin Richards, son of Reed Richards and the Invisible Woman, has some really powerful abilities, and in one instance in particular, he shows what he's capable of in a really impressive way. The young boy harnesses the dimensions of space, time, and reality to develop his very own universe, which he creates to be small enough to fit in his own pocket, hence the name. And although we don't see everything that goes on inside this fabricated pocket universe, we can assume that no matter what, it's gotta be a weird existence. Especially when a ball of lint in the boy's pocket is probably the size of thousands of solar systems put together. At number 7 is Marvel 1602. This is a fun one, but it's definitely quite bizarre at the same time. It might be pretty obvious by the name, but basically, this universe tells the stories of the heroes and villains we know today as if they lived in the 1600s. With Count Otto von Doom ruling a medieval Latveria, heroes like Matthew Murdock, a blind mercenary for hire, and Peter Parkwa, an orphan recruited by Sir Nicholas Fury, have to put a stop to him. Another bizarre thing about this world is that mutants aren't seen as superheroes and aren't part of a team called the X-Men, but are instead known as witch breeds, and they are hunted down systematically by anyone who will dare challenge them. It's definitely a fun world to explore, but it sort of gives me the creeps as well. Number 6, Spider Boy. What happens when you take Connor Kent's Superboy and mix him with Peter Parker's Spider-Man? You get Spider Boy. Spider Boy is one of those rare and amazing creations that came out of the days of Amalgam Comics. For those who are unfamiliar with Amalgam Comics, it was a magical joint comic line that existed between both DC Comics and Marvel Comics. These two publishers came together to combine their worlds, mashing up heroes and stories to give us new characters who are in inspired by their roster of superheroes and supervillains from each of their unique multiverses. Spider Boy as such is one of those characters. Spider Boy was a clone who was created by Project Cadmus to be a duplicate of the Amalgam Universe's super soldier, but with the added ability to manipulate gravity. Peter Parker was the scientist who was in charge of creating this clone, but he died during the process after his project was basically sabotaged. As a result, the clone created was much younger than intended. He was named Pete after his creator by General Thaddeus Ross, who was overseeing this project. Unfortunately, Ross, who Pete came to know as his Uncle Jen, was killed by a mugger. As a result, Pete lamented his young age as this had made the mugger dismiss him and focus on Ross. Spider Boy vowed from that day on to become undismissible so all criminals would focus on him. 
instead of innocent bystanders. Number five, Spider Man. Another one of my favorite alternate spider weirdos is Spider Man. I love Spider Man. Spider Man spun out of a what if story, which aimed to answer the question what if Aunt May had been bitten by a radioactive spider? The question we were all, I'm sure, itching to know the answer to at the time. This first happened to May in issue number 23 of the 1977 What If series. May was basically bringing Peter his lunch, which he had forgotten at home, when she was the one who ended up being bitten by the radioactive spider in his place. In May's reality, both Peter and Ben are still alive and well and actually act as her allies, while she fights to protect New York and stop criminals in their tracks. Kind of like a cute little family team. I love it. Number four, Japanese. Spider-Man, or Spider-Man, as he is also sometimes known. Japanese Spider-Man is very different from the one we know in North America. In Japan, Spider-Man actually had his own TV show, but with that, he also got a radically different backstory. It's really wild and really great. If you think you know Spider-Man, you likely will be very surprised by this version of Spider-Man. Spider-Man here is Takuya Yamashiro, who got his spider-like abilities from a dying alien. Along with these abilities, he was also given Leopardon, a giant robot mech spaceship. Yep. The alien who gave him his abilities is named Garia, and actually hails from another world known as Planet Spider. Prior to becoming the hero Spider-Man, and even after, Yamashiro was known for being a talented motocross racer. Also, the intro for the 1970s show is still one of my all time favorite intros I've ever probably heard in the existence of television intros. And I honestly still think it slaps today. Number three, Spider Ham. This version of Spider Man is actually a web slinging cartoon pig. Spider Ham hails from a reality that is similar to the Toontown we see in the classic film Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Physics aren't really the same as our world, but instead are reimagined to be kind of wacky like how they are in classic cartoons. I don't know about you, but to me, this has always made Spider him not only seem like one of the weirdest variants around, but also kind of one of the most powerful just because of that. Because I feel like if you have tuned physics, like watch out. Spider Ham's civilian name is Peter Porker, and he hails from the reality designated number 8311. In Spider Ham's origin story, he actually started out as a spider, but after being bitten by a radioactive sort of rage fueled pig named May Porker, who actually was a scientist simply trying to try out an atomic powered hair dryer at the time which went awry and kind of put her into a fit of rage, he was transformed into a pig. This is the true story. Despite being turned into a pig, he still kept all of his spider-like abilities and powers, hence Spider Ham. Number two, Widow, AKA Spider Horse. Although if you look up Spider Horse on Google, you might actually get a different character before you get Widow. But editorial speaking, Spider Horse is still a name that is used with this character. So I'm still mentioning it here because I still think it's relevant and I like saying Spider Horse. Remember when I was telling you about web slinger Patrick O'Hara living in the wild, wild west times? Well, he's not the only one who receives spider-like abilities. No, no, no. His horse was also bitten by the same elixir doused radioactive spider. And guess what? He got powers too. Widow is Patrick O'Hara's loyal steed who also became a spider like hero and even was recruited alongside Web Slinger to join the Web Warriors and fight against the inheritors during the Spider Verse event. Spider Horse is also one of the Spider Man variants we see or will see in Across the Spider Verse. Fun facts. At least it seems like we'll see him. He's in the trailer, so I feel like he's gonna be in there. Number one, Spidey Super Stories. I love this one. <laughs> the Electric Company actually brought us the first ever live action depiction of Spider Man, if you can believe that, with their Spidey Super Stories skits. In these skits, Spider Man was portrayed by puppeteer and dancer Danny Seagram. This version of Spider Man never spoke, but instead acted out his intentions that were communicated by a narrator who told the story. Fun fact Morgan Freeman was actually one of the actors who had narrating credits for these skits, so if you go back and listen to some of them, you might hear his very familiar voice. He was a member of the Electric Company cast, so that's why you will hear that. In these stories, Spider-Man took on villains like Dr. Fly and Spoiler. Spoiler was all about ruining things for folks, hence his name, Spoiler, he likes to spoil things. Dr. Fly, on the other hand, was a half-human, half-mutant who wanted to transform everyone on the planet into a mutant like he was. All of these villains were so strange and so great. And you should go back and watch some of these skits because they're pretty fantastic. Number 10, Dr. Murrow. The interesting thing too about Dr. Murrow is that some spelling for this character is like Dr. Morrow. 
but if you actually look at the comic itself, it's Murrow with a U, so I believe it's Murrow with a U, but if you say Morrow and I say Murrow, that's also fine. <laughs> I'm not gonna come for you. Dr. Murrow appears in the What If issue number 11 from the 1997 series. Here we answer the question, what if the Marvel bullpen had been transformed into the Fantastic Four? Being from a different time period, there are definitely some extremely uh, sexist tones in this issue. A lot of it aimed, sadly, at fabulous Flo Steinberg, who stands in for Invisible Woman. But another ridiculous aspect of this issue, aside from that more serious one, are some of the villains that we see the bullpen version of the FF face off against. Like their first villain, Dr. Murrow. Dr. Murrow's island was the one that they planned on visiting before they were delivered some fan mail. Upon opening it up, they found a mysterious radio-like device which transformed them into the Fantastic Four, granting them powers after they were exposed to cosmic rays that the device emitted. Turns out that this was all part of a Skrull plot, which we find out later in the issue, and that Dr. Murrow was also a victim of a similar device. Oh no. But even with that, why did he attack them when they got to his island? Why is he a villain in all this? Why is he one of the first villains we run into? Did the transformation like make him, I don't know, just really mad or something? Or violent? The reality is they probably just wanted to start the issue off with a good fight and a bit of mystery, but still, Murrow ends up being a pretty bizarre villain because of this because there's things that just aren't explained here. Oh well, I, I'm willing to come along for this strange ride in any what if. Number nine, disappointed Loki. In the what if story, what if the Hulk had the brain of Bruce Banner, we get to see what would happen if the Hulk had kept Banner's wits and then ran into Loki's illusion, you know, with the train tracks and such. Turns out this version of the Hulk was too smart to fall for Loki's trap. Seeing the TNT on the train tracks, but believing it to be an illusion, meant that he would never be put onto a collision course with the Avengers and therefore would never join that team. Instead, Loki ends up disappointed and Banner goes on to fight against Galactic joining with Professor X and Reed Richards to create the new and extremely powerful uni-being of X-Man. Poor Loki though, he's like, but I set this trap in. All right. <laughs> I guess not all traps are winners. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to show some support for us on other platforms, head on over to Facebook, give us a like, give us a follow, it does help us out, and we're going to have lots of exciting new content coming for you over there. <gasps> Exciting. Number 8. Fake Captain America Both weird and great in a lot of ways. Fake Captain America was William Burnside. Now while William Burnside does exist in the 616 universe, where he was a well-meaning Captain America imposter driven mad by improper use of the super soldier serum, in the what if reality of Earth 84444, he ended up becoming obsessed with communists, paranoid that they could be lurking around every corner. Which is kind of what happened in the main continuity. but. In this one, he's less like, oh no, it's just the super soldier serum, and more like he made some conscious choices here. Modeling America into less of a democracy under the name of Captain America, Burnside would be beaten back by the real Captain America, who in this story doesn't resurface until 1984, which means that Burnside has a lot of time to basically do harm to the American image and the influence of the nation's people. This warning story and the speech the real Cap gives at the end are both still pretty relevant today, which is why this is like a great issue, but also why it's kind of weird. <laughs> it's kind of weird how there's a lot of stuff in this that I feel like is still relevant, even though it's from 1984. Do we ever do new things, or does history just cycle in like some vicious loop? Probably that. Number seven, Colonel Bruce Banner. What if Bruce Banner was actually the monster and Hulk was just purely the good guy? Well, that is the question we dive into in issue 91 of the 1989 series. Here, Bruce Banner mistreats his wife, Betty Ross, who eventually becomes, of course, Betty Banner. Bruce is cruel and unkind, but after he is involved in a gamma radiation explosion, another half of him emerges, a glowing green light-like figure who is gentle and kind and we know as Starman basically this world's Hulk, and he was actually terrified of Bruce himself. Not only is this villain pretty interesting, unique, and strange, but the story is also like epically sad. Despite Betty reaching out for help to both her father and others around her, it seems that no one actually really believes Betty when it comes to the fact that like Bruce mistreats her? In the end, she is confined to a mental institution, as she is believed to have gone insane. But at least there, she appears to be safe from Bruce and his cruelty, so it's like a sad, but I guess sort of happy ending. It's bittersweet is what it is. Ugh. Number six, Mr. Mixelpidilic. Look, 
I talked about Batmite when discussing heroes, and he wasn't even really a hero. So how can I not mention the first fifth dimensional imp in this video? Plus he's got a fun name. Mr. Mixelpidalic is a reality warping imp obsessed with Superman, who just like his rival Batmite did with Batman, simply seeks to annoy the hell out of Superman and just prove he is smarter than him. Which is good, because he has a level of power that in other hands could cause the entire end of the multiverse. More on that later though. He can do almost anything imaginable if he wishes it. And his only weakness really is being convinced or tricked into saying his name backwards to send him back to the fifth dimension. Which if you're trying to say it correctly is honestly a superpower in and of itself. Click, click, clitopazixum, clitopazixum. Clitopazixum, I got it. Mixopidalic, click. Number 5 Emperor Joker Mr. Mixelpidalic has an extreme level of power like I said. Also like I said, if this power fell into the wrong hands it could be potentially reality ending. Now what hands could be worse than the psychotic hands of Batman's arch nemesis the Joker? Well that's exactly who gets the power in the Emperor Joker storyline. Mr. Mix gets bored and wants to give Joker 1% of his power just to see the tricks Joker is able to pull off. But instead, the Joker turns tricks Mr. Mixopidalic into giving him 99.9% .9 of his power instead. Joker uses this power to rewrite all of reality to become his sick, twisted dream world. He eats the whole population of China out of a Chinese food container box. He keeps everyone stuck in a time loop, including Batman, who he introduces to the afterlife over and over every day forever. Oh, and he also turned Flash into a slow-moving obese man. Superman, the Spectre, and Mr. Mixopidalic being the only ones who who can remember the former world try to do something about this all powerful Joker. But that's just the problem. He is all powerful. He destroys all of reality, but he can't bring himself to destroy Batman fully. And because of this, he loses control of his power, allowing the Spectre and Mr. Mix to steal it back and fix all of reality. But this story is it's pretty nuts. Number four, Condiment King. When the villainous Condiment King came on the scene, it was literally on the scene, as he appeared in the animated Batman TV show from 1992. One of the best, honestly. Condiment King was Buddy Stantler, a comedian who was brainwashed by the Joker into becoming a villain who wields condiment squirters and viciously horrible puns. I knew you'd catch up to me sooner or later. How I've relished this meeting. Come Batman, let's see if you can cut the mustard. Diabolical stuff like that. The puns get even worse in the comics with his real name becoming a pun on its own. Mitchell Mayo. He isn't taken seriously by anyone. His weapons don't actually project his condiments at a speed fast enough to do anyone harm, but they sure are inconvenient, leaving nasty stains in your superhero costume. On the other hand, he does potentially have the ability to be able to cause anaphylactic shock if he is battling someone with an allergy, right? Number three, Monsieur Mala and the brain. Monsieur Mala is described in his wiki as <clears throat> a militant, super intelligent French gorilla. The brain, on the other hand, is described as a genius French scientist and master criminal who exists as a disembodied brain. So, those two descriptions are interesting enough on their own, but when I tell you the French militant gorilla and the disembodied brain are an item together, I think that just elevates the whole thing to a different level. Together, they are the primary leaders of the Brotherhood of Evil, who were villains to both the Doom Patrol and the Teen Titans. They both appeared in Doom Patrol 86 in 1964. Now Brain was once a scientist who experimented on the gorilla who would become Mala, which would increase Mala's intelligence. An accident injured Ernst, and Mala had to remove Ernst's brain and place it in a technological holding thingy-majig to keep him alive and be able to communicate. The two are almost always together with Mala carrying around the brain. Hey look, I don't judge. You find love where you find love, but as a concept for supervillains who lead a team of supervillains, you gotta admit it's, it's pretty odd to say the least. Number two, Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. Let me repeat that for all those in the back who may not have heard. Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. I don't really have a problem with two thirds of that. I just get really hung up on the vegetable part. Is that weird? Sven Larsen is the man who claims that title. And while it is a completely ridiculous one, it is actually pretty fitting. Sven fell victim to an experiment of his own making, which allows him to transform into any animal, vegetable, or mineral, either partially or fully, although 
He very obviously likes to do a bit of all three at the same time, which is an odd choice, but hey, I just work here. Animal Vegetable Mineral Man first appeared in Doom Patrol 89 in August 1964, and he is an enemy to the team, which makes sense given their weirdness. But Animal Vegetable Mineral Man here has a vendetta against the Doom Patrol's leader, the Chief, who he believed once stole an invention of his. An invention that, funnily enough, is the only way of stopping Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. But he didn't even do that, so it, I don't know. Look, it gets weirder and weirder, but I gotta move on. Before I do though, Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. Okay, sorry, I just wanted to get out of my system one more time. <laughs> Number one, Mr. Mind. I think anyone who hasn't heard of this villain before would be forgiven. When you think of the most fearsome villains, specifically the villains of Captain Marvel, otherwise known as Shazam, you may not first think about the seven inch long sentient worm from Venus known as Mr. Mind. This diabolically evil mind controlling worm, after the events of Infinite Crisis, would cocoon himself and then emerge as a massive monstrosity capable of manipulating reality, consuming universes, and traveling through time and space. He was described as eating years and events from this universe's history, altering the earth with every flap of his wings. It took a combined effort from Booster Gold, Supernova, and Skeets to defeat Mr. Mind by trapping him inside Skeets' shell which was fortified by the Suspendium. Then, Booster Gold threw Skeets through time with the help of Supernova to the day he was first discovered on Earth by Dr. Savannah. And then he is trapped in a time loop forever. So they didn't even actually end up like ending him. They just trapped him. This all powerful mind controlling seven inch long worm. Number 10, Gorgon. If you remember the weirdest DC Multiverse Superheroes video, which you should check out, I talked about a pastiche of the Incredible Hulk in DC Comics called Big Baby from Earth 8. He was part of a team called the Retaliators, who were supposed to be a joke version of the Avengers. This universe also had a team of villains called the Extremists. And on that team was a Dr. Octopus type character named Gorgon. While Gorgon did utilize technological enhancements, I think his octopus likeness comes in the form of his prehensile hair. The hair tentacles he uses and his role as a scientist mixed with his weight and oddly familiar glasses all come together to really evoke a Dr. Octopus likeness which is just weird enough to make me double take. He is also familiar enough that I can't really put him any higher on this list, so there's that. Number 9, Dex Star or Dex Star, or Dexter, or Dex Star, Dex Star -ra -ra. Cats can be ruthless, cold, and scary at times. I'll admit that. But while the Red Lantern of Sector 2814, Dex Star, is an irrationally rage-filled kitty, it's all because he loved his owner. Dex Star's origin shows the cat Dexter with his owner when she is attacked by robbers who broke into her home. While Dexter tried his best to scratch the attacker, he ended up ending the life of Dexter's owner. When the police showed up on the scene, Dexter was kicked out into the streets so as to not contaminate the scene. Now two rascals from the streets found Dexter when he was trying to sleep, put him in a sack, and threw him into a river. Now that is one hell of a sequence of events. And all this happening filled the poor little kitty with enough rage that it caught the attention of Atrocitus, who called out to him and made him a Red Lantern. With this newfound power of the Red Lantern ring, the rage kitty exacted his sweet revenge on the hoodlums and flew to say goodbye to his owner one last time, saying in his little cat language, I find who hurt you, I kill. I good kitty. I love this cat, but I also I also wouldn't dare mess with it ever. Number 8, Prometheus. Heroes and villains with no powers always seem to be some of the most powerful. It's strange. Take Prometheus. After seeing his criminal parents pass at the hands of police, he vows a vendetta on any form of justice. A vendetta that would push him to be able to defeat the whole Justice League single-handedly. He shot the Martian Manhunter with a dart that turned his power against him and set him on fire. He infected Steel's armor with a computer virus which commanded the suit to damage the watchtower. He hypnotized the Huntress into unconsciousness. He attacked Green Lantern with a neural chaff that rendered his ring useless. He trapped the angel Zariel in limbo. He tricked the Flash into believing that he had planted motion sensitive devices that would explode if the Flash used his powers. And he defeated Batman in hand to hand combat. That's probably the most nuts thing on this list. His origin is very similar to Batman's. After his parents were dispatched from the mortal plane, he would travel the globe training and becoming the ultimate combat machine. But he also attended the top universities 
learning as much as he could. He eventually sets up a base in the ghost zone. And from here, he built an armor that could download information on any opponent's fighting style, kind of reminiscent of Taskmaster's ability. He is kind of crazy capable, and his vendetta on any kind of justice plus his Batman likeness just makes him kind of a little strange to me. But also terrifying. Number seven, Earth 17 Superman. On Earth 17, superheroes are a product of government experiments. The Superman of this universe, Overman, was the first, with the other superheroes being spawns of his DNA. Now that may be weird, but that ain't the weird part. He also doesn't really seem like a villain yet, does he? Well, after contracting a disease, a disease, you know, contracting a disease from another person, yes, like that kind of disease, he goes insane and destroys the Justice League and reduces his world to rubble. He then gets his filthy paws on a doomsday boom boom that he intends to use on Earth-17 and wipe it out. The crisis on infinite Earths destroyed this reality, just like DC tried to destroy such a naughty Superman story. Even having different iterations of Overmans who were different, like like an Overman who became allied with the Axis powers in World War II. But the internet never forgets DC Comics, and people like me exist to remind everyone of the things you published into this world. I am sorry, sort of. Thanks for the content. Number six, Mr. Fantastic. So, Mr. Fantastic in this story is still Reed Richards, but he's also Dr. Doom. Let me explain. In issue number six of the 1997 What If series, we get to explore an alternate world where the Fantastic Four were granted different powers. These powers seem to have been inspired more by their personality traits. As such, Reed Richards becomes a big brain. Literally, he's just a brain. Instead of him staying as a big disembodied brain though, with mental or psionic capacities, if you will, he ends up being convinced by Dr. Doom to go with him so that Doom might help him by using his knowledge of robotics to build him a humanoid body. You know that when Doom is like, please, l let me help you, Reed Richards, that's not what's about to happen. In reality, Doom's plan is to use Reed's powerful brain form to power his time travel machine. The Fantastic Four come to save Reed and a battle ensues, eventually resulting in a massive explosion when Doom attempts to activate his machine. Just as the explosion goes off though, Reed manages to use his mental brain powers to move his mind into Doom's body. As a result, Doom, which I assume moves into Reed's brain form, ends up dead, and Reed lives on, but within the scarred body of Dr. Doom. So now it just looks like Doom is leading the FF. Pretty cool, but also pretty weird. Number five, Space Admiral Von Strucker. In the what if story from issue number 14 of the 1977 series, we answer the question, what if Sergeant Fury had fought World War II in outer space? Turns out that events would be... As expected, pretty weird. The whole premise is that on this alternate Earth, humans got to space a lot sooner and ended up being pulled into a conflict where they fought against the Baytans. Strucker himself was an admiral. Strucker would end up on the side of humanity, but would ultimately betray humankind and Earth to ally himself with the Baytans. He saw an opportunity for Germany, who he was more loyal to than, you know, just Earth in general. Even though, you know, Germany's part of Earth, so I feel like maybe an interesting choice. On his part. Basically, he believed that if the Baytans took over as their allies, Germany would be in a better place than they were now. So he decided to betray his fellow space soldiers, which actually I guess kind of does make sense considering everything that happened after World War One. Space wars are always fun and weird though, and this story and its antagonists are, of course, no exception. Number four, Hypnofish. The Hypnofish that appears in What If issue number one from the 1977 series is actually a character that has appeared in the main continuity. A character? A type of fish, <laughs> whether there is only a single Hypnofish or more than one. This is a character who has only made a few appearances in even the main continuity since their first 616 appearance in 1963 in Fantastic Four issue number 14. But they also appear as Namor the Submariner's villainous ally in the first What If issue where we answer the question, what if Spider-Man had joined the Fantastic Four? The end result is that Namor successfully uses his Hypnofish friend to kidnap Sue Storm, but instead of being rescued as she was in issue number 14 of FF, she ends up staying with Namor and uh, ultimately becoming his queen. All because Spider-Man is on the team, which leaves her kind of feeling like isolated from them. In the end, his Hypnofish and Mentofish plot is successful, and Sue chooses to remain with Namor. 
Also, yes, there are also mento fish. That's a thing too. An even more rare thing than hypno fish, I believe. Number three, Loki, Prince of Jotunheim. Another one of my favorite episodes from Marvel's and Disney Plus's What If series for just how lighthearted and adorable it was, was one that asked the question, what if Thor were an only child? The answer was that Thor would basically be kind of a well-loved brat who was obsessed with partying as opposed to heroics. Not only did we get party Thor in this episode though, we also got friendly frost giant Loki, who is also known of course as the Prince of Jotunheim. Instead of Loki being adopted by Odin and growing up to be the villain we normally know him as, the sort of jealous and vengeful brother of Thor, he becomes Thor's best friend and ally who also seems to enjoy a good party. And I gotta say, I kinda love it. <laughs> super weird and super great. Number two, Galactus. Galactus is a pretty complex character. Sometimes he's a villain, at times he's been a hero, currently I'm pretty sure in the main continuity he's dead and his corpse is maybe being used as part of Thor's throne room, but either way, when it comes down to it, despite being a cosmic inevitability, Galactus often threatens entire worlds with his hunger, which, you know, it feels pretty villainous. And yet even he can end up with a happy ending where he gets to enjoy the simple life. All it takes is for Thanos to use the infinity gauntlet to wipe his mind and send him to Earth to live as a human. Hey, it's so easy. In this story, this attempt to neutralize Galactus results in him being recognized, despite his amnesia, as Elvis. This is because Galen in his human form happens to sound and look just like Elvis, coincidentally. When Adam Warlock finds him after defeating Thanos and offers to return Galactus to his prior form and power, he actually refuses and decides to live out his days on Earth with his new partner Gertrude and her son, basically filling in as the planet's, uh, I guess, Elvis replacement following the mysterious death of the real Elvis. Which, I mean, fair enough. I mean, if I came to Earth and then people thought I was Elvis, I'd probably be like, you know what? I think I'm good. I'll just chill here. This is a pretty good life. Number one, Juggernaut. In this bizarre what if issue, we asked the question, what if Professor X of the X-Men had become the Juggernaut? Which is a strange question and is also a great question. Obviously, instead of his brother, Kane Marco obviously, who is normally the juggernaut. This story takes place in the pages of issue 13 of the 1989 What If series. Here we see that Professor X is trapped under the rubble of the caved-in tomb where Sidorak's gem awaited an avatar. So Charles becomes the avatar of Sidorak and not only gains great physical power, but has his psychic mutant power basically increased as well. Because he was not around to form the X-Men, the Fantastic Four fight against Magneto in their place, which causes anti-mutant hysteria as a result. In response, when Juggernaut surfaces, he creates his own team of mutants to enforce anti-human laws in response, Woo! becoming a powerful villain as opposed to friend and ally of humankind. Would have gone a lot differently. Number 10, Spiders Man. If you were wondering if I misspoke there, no, I did not. Spiders Man is one of my favorite alternates out there actually because, well, he's just so creepy. He's definitely a weirdo because he is literally made out of spiders. Ugh. This version of Peter Parker, instead of being bit by a radioactive spider, actually fell into basically like a vat of experimental spiders. As a result, he was consumed by them and his consciousness manifested within them. Although the real Peter Parker was actually dead and gone, being completely devoured, his mind lived on in the spiders who were connected by his consciousness and came together to create basically a humanoid form. This version of Spider-Man really can never reveal his secret identity as doing so would reveal that he's actually not a person at all, but just a bunch of spiders all huddled together in the shape of a man. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love when we talk about Spider-Man content, I love talking about Spider-Man and all of the Spider-Verse stuff, be sure to check out our Spider-Man playlist. We've got a lot more content over there for you. Number nine, Web Slinger. I love this alternate Spider-Man. While odd, I'd also say he's a pretty cool variant as well. This alternate version of Spider-Man hails from the wild, wild west. Patrick O'Hara hails from the alternate reality of Earth 31913. He was a traveler who would show off his shooting skills in shows, giving gun presentations. Doc Morbius also traveled along with him. While Patrick would show off his shooting skills along the road, Morbius would sell his elixir. One day, the elixir doused a radioactive spider and and after that spider bit Patrick, he noticed he now had spider-like abilities and powers. Tragically, Morbius began to drink his elixir, which actually turned him into a vampire, forcing the web slinger to track down his once old friend and 
to feed him. That's what you do to vampires, especially when they're being all creepy and drinking people's blood. Number eight, Spider Punk. Spider Punk is a strange one, but is also another favorite of mine from the Spider Verse. Spider Punk seems to be one of the alternate versions of Spider Man that we'll see appearing in across the Spider Verse. This version of Spider Man is not Peter Parker, but instead Hobby Brown or Hobbert Brown. In this reality, Hobby Brown is a punk rocker who not only possesses spider like abilities, but also the power of rock. In fact, at one point, he actually used his music skills to defeat an alternate version of Venom, cranking up the volume and using an army of amps. Now, of course, this Venom was very different, but Still, it's a super cool story. I love it. Number seven, Superior Spider Man. What if one of Spider Man's greatest foes became Spider Man himself? Well, we know what happens because this actually has happened actually a few times in the comics. Now, one of the most memorable and strangest occurrences of this was when Spider Man actually traded bodies with Dr. Octopus. You know, I've short formed that name so much in recent years that it actually feels weird to say his whole supervillain title name now, Dr. Octopus. Why does that feel so weird? Otto at the time was on his deathbed and in an attempt to save his mind and preserve it, managed to trick Peter into swapping bodies with him. Initially, Doc Ock just wanted to use Peter's younger body to save himself and actually had no interest in taking Peter's place. However, as Peter in Otto's body lay on now his deathbed, because they'd swapped bodies and he was in Otto's failing body, he managed to convince Otto that the world needed Spider-Man and to take up the mantle and continue what Peter had started when he became Spider-Man years ago. Otto surprised us all by actually agreeing, vowing to act as a hero, and to even do better than Peter had, dubbing himself Superior Spider-Man. Which honestly, that last part, not so surprising for Otto Octavius. Although ultimately, Otto wouldn't necessarily do better he wouldn't necessarily be a better Spider-Man. Some very interesting things came out of this massive storyline. And there are still some people that argue that Superior Spider-Man is better. So, I mean, I guess that's for you, the reader, to decide. Danger. This villain is definitely a weird one. It's basically just the humanoid form of the Danger Room, a highly sophisticated computer interface that the X-Men used to train. But in 2009's Astonishing X-Men number 9, the Danger Room comes to life and takes on a humanoid form that calls itself Danger. Although I know this isn't a what if issue, in 2010's What If Astonishing X Men number one, Danger gets a more focused storyline and it's even weirder than you might expect. Basically, Ultron somehow catches wind that Danger has come to life and falls in love with her. They become a couple and go on a murder spree, killing all the X-Men and then eventually Professor X himself. Then they take to the cosmos and continue to kill all the organic life forms in their path until they finally establish their own intergalactic empire. It's later pondered by the Watcher that if Professor X had only listened to Danger when she declared that she had gained sentience, she wouldn't have been so inclined to take him down. It's sort of a cool message about the dangers of AI, but first and foremost, it's just a weird antagonist in this what if issue. The danger room gets married to Ultron. It doesn't get much weirder than that, I don't think. Number five, Thanos. Another one of my favorites has to come from the What If Disney Plus streaming show, where we actually got to see what Thanos would be like if he were on the side of good. So technically here, I guess he's a hero, but of course in the main continuity, we know him better as a villain, both in the comics and the MCU, so yeah. Thanos ends up joining the Ravagers and becoming a close ally of Star-Lord in episode 2 of the show, where we get to explore what the world would be like if T'Challa, instead of Peter Quill, ended up as Star-Lord. And guess what? Turns out the world would potentially be um, a lot better for it. Mine is the imminent doom of the universe as a result of Ego's plot to kind of like take it over, but ignoring that. Other than that, it was doing pretty well for itself, I gotta say. Thanos didn't even snap half the universe out of existence in this reality, and all because T'Challa convinced him not to do so by simply talking him down. Man, where was Black Panther when that was happening before? Why didn't he just come in and be like, hey, look, Thanos, no. Maybe he's got to travel in space before he can have those conversational skills. Maybe that's why. At number four is Cable. So in this two-part what if issue, Cable is the bad guy and he actually kills his parents, Cyclops and Jean Grey, as well as Professor X. Professor X seems to be getting a lot of heat on this list. 
And even though this is a what if and basically anything goes, it's just a really bizarre call to have part of the X-Men family travel through time to kill his parents and their noble mentor, Charles Xavier. This naturally doesn't go unnoticed and actually starts an all out war between the X-Men and the X-Force. And while these two groups are duking it out, Magneto takes the opportunity to take control of Washington DC, which segues into that second part I mentioned, aptly named, what if Magneto took over the USA? But regardless, this just made me feel weird to see a character we're used to seeing as a hero just take a sudden turn to evil, so much to the point where he kills his own flesh and blood in a brutal massacre. And why? Well. They have some differences in ideology. But why does that matter if they're in the past? Couldn't Cable have just stayed in his own time and believed in stuff over there? Although he's not really known to stay in his own time very often. It's just that he normally does it for good instead of doing it to start a massive war that ends in Sentinels dropping nukes on Washington and killing everyone. I don't know, was it worth it Cable? Check out the issue and see if you think. Number 3, Electra. Electra makes an appearance in the 1977 What If series in issue number 34. This being a humor issue, we get to take a look at what might have happened had Electra survived her run in with Bullseye. Even though Electra at this time was depicted as a villain or, you know, at least an extremely edgy anti hero, it seems that this one panel take on the character has her reconsider her life of crime as a result of her near death experience. This is uh, pretty weird considering I'm pretty sure at this point Electra would have had already a few near death experiences in her line of work as an assassin. So like unless she knew she was going to die here and then that's not what happened. But I feel like for her this is just an average Tuesday. Electra even goes so far as to consider settling down and getting married. And I quote, or something. What is or something? Also. Electra getting married just because she didn't die from bullseye fighting her? Wow, that just seems a little unbelievable. Anything can happen in an alternate reality. Number two is Dazzler. In What If number 33, the question is asked, what if Dazzler had become the Herald of Galactus? These days, Dazzler is known to be a relatively stagnant member of the X-Men and doesn't usually get a lot of mention in the mainstream. Sorry Amanda, Amanda really likes Dazzler. However, in the 80s, it was a totally different story. Right before this issue of What If in 1981, Dazzler is taken on by Galactus as his Herald but only to complete a quick mission to retrieve his original Herald. Then she goes back home. But fast forward one year later to 1982, and in this what if, the situation is revisited again. But in this case, she stays as his Herald and actually becomes one of the most powerful villains in all the cosmos. The Herald of Galactus is an individual imbued with part of Galactus's power cosmic, and their job is to fly around the cosmos and look for planets for Galactus to consume. So it's a pretty big deal to be given the title of Herald, both for the one who's selected and for the people of the cosmos. because. If you're doing your job right as a herald, you'd best believe you're ruining and ending the lives of countless others. So for Dazzler, of all the heroes to be taken in by Galactus and given this responsibility, it just leaves me with a weird feeling in my gut. Like why would a character that barely wants to be a hero and only really wants to sing, like why, why would they take on the job of Herald of Galactus? The answer does lie in this issue, but it's still a bit confusing and Maybe a bit out of character for Dazzler, which is why I put it at number two. Number one, Susie Richards. In issue number 30 of the 1989 What If series, Susie, Reed and Sue's second child, becomes the villain. Susie is obviously meant to be a stand in for Valeria Richards, who we have now, their daughter, who has a weird history where she was kind of both the oldest and then like the youngest child of the fantastic duo. It's, it's confusing, but don't worry about it. In this version of the story, she is most definitely just the younger, but despite being the younger sibling between her and Franklin, she still terrifies her brother who in the main continuity was once known for insanely powerful reality warping abilities. Although I don't think he has those in this reality. But anyways, you know you're scary when you're scaring Franklin even a young Franklin. Susie is an evil little girl who it turns out was possessed by a hellspawn that came from the negative zone. In the end, Franklin is forced to fight and defeat her, but unfortunately all too late as the rest of his family has already been killed by her. Even Dr. Doom doesn't stand a chance against the possessed Susie. Poor Franklin, he warned everyone but they didn't listen. Leapfrog. This spring loaded villain appears in the what if that has Aunt May gaining Spider-Man's powers instead of Peter Parker. And before you jump down my throat, 
Leapfrog does appear in other comics first, I know this, actually first showing up in Daredevil number 25, but this iteration of the character is clearly meant to be more slapstick and ridiculous than he normally is, which is saying a lot considering this must be one of the silliest villains in Marvel. But case in point, his first appearance in this what if issue shows him crashing through a brick wall and just swearing at everybody, screaming expletives as he bounces past a group of civilians and a news reporter. He ends up in a battle with Aunt May's Spider Woman and gets thwarted by nothing other than a stretchy mass of dough that Aunt May uses to lasso him into a tree. He's just clearly such a dumb villain and appears for what I could only imagine was comedic value to the already hysterical what if issue. Number 9, Ghost Grandpa. While technically ghost riders are supposed to be heroes, this one doesn't seem to be too nice in terms of the brief glimpse that we see of him. And it's because of that that I decided to include him as a kind of like a low key villain. Ghost Grandpa makes his appearance in the 1977 What If series in issue number 34, where we ask the question, what if Ghost Rider had possessed someone else, instead of Johnny Blaze of course. The answer allows us to take a look at a few different candidates including Ghost Skater and Ghost Baby, but while both talk about punishing evildoers and getting vengeance, Ghost Grandpa only seems to be interested in getting revenge on his nurse for delaying his glass of warm milk. Number 8 is Wolverine Lord of Vampires. This villain is bizarre because it's the embodiment of a character we've all known forever but who doesn't really exhibit any of his typical traits. In What If Number 24, Wolverine takes on the Lord of Vampires who tries to bite him to turn Wolverine into a vampire himself. And since Wolverine was too badass to simply be turned into a vampire, he decides it's only in his character to kill the guy. And he does, but what happens when you kill the Lord of Vampires is that you take on the title yourself. And this is when Wolverine starts to change into a very strange version of himself. Right away, Wolverine starts turning turning his former friends into vampires with his demeanor totally shifting as he uses like mind control powers on them, which is just pretty strange on its own. Honestly, this is what it is. It's just weird seeing Wolverine without any level of humanity in him anymore. Something about this transformation doesn't seem right and gives me some very conflicting feelings towards the whole thing. Although I gotta say, he does turn out to be a pretty powerful Lord of Vampires. He even takes out Doctor Strange in a harrowing battle, which says a lot for Wolverine on its own. This suggests that the power level this suggests that his power level is pretty heavily increased after getting the title of Lord of Vampires. Doesn't change the pop collar and bat eared hairdo though. This is a list about weird villains, not powerful ones. Although he might end up on both, he still ranks on this one for sure. I mean just look at him. Number seven, Maggie Nito. Maggie Nito appears in a humor issue of What If. She's the one who terrorizes poor old styrofoam skeleton Wolverine. She's technically supposed to be the female child version of Magneto, who is known in the comics for ripping the adamantium out of Wolverine over the course of a few horrifying panels of comics. Maggie Nito, on the other hand, doesn't need any powers to hurt her version of Wolverine, who is much more cowardly in comparison to his main continuity counterpart. Which, I mean, makes sense, considering he literally has a styrofoam skeleton. I mean, I would be afraid of Maggie Nito too if I had a styrofoam skeleton. Also just in general, she seems like a mean little girl. At number 6 we have the Zombieverse. This is one I'm sure many of you are familiar with as it's become pretty popular over the years. Basically, Earth 2149 is overrun by zombies and they don't stop short of turning superheroes to the ghoulish side as well as humans. What we end up with is a whole universe with super powered zombies jumping and flying around trying to destroy everything in their past including their former teammates and lifelong friends. It's a strange place that puts into question the integrity of super powered beings and sort of tarnishes the dignity of all our favorite heroes all at once. But it's all in good fun in the end and we get an exciting, gory and very weird read as a result. At number 5 is the Amalgam Universe. This is a strange one because it outlines the event of a what if scenario Scenario where Marvel and DC characters are mashed into hybrids. In Marvel vs DC number 3, characters from Marvel's Earth 616 and DC's New Earth morph together leaving us with some pretty cool but ultimately just flat out weird characters. Like a Superman Captain America mashup and Iron Man getting a power ring turning him into Iron Lantern. And of course with these newly powered up amalgam heroes, there also has to be a mashup version of the two different worlds villains too, right? So we get Thanoside, a very cleverly named mashup of Darkseid and Thanos. What makes this universe so weird is that it's a very rare example of the two comic book companies coming together in unison. And the resulting contents are just as bizarre as this rare partnership is. So there you have it. 
The Weird World of the Amalgam Universe at number five. And at number four is Weird World. I feel like there's no need to explain why this one ended up on the list given the title. But weirdly enough, Weird World isn't actually that weird, all things considered. Weird enough to make it on this list, but I still feel like they had an opportunity to make a world so weird that they clinched the number one spot on this list. But still, it's a weird one. I am tired of saying that word. It's a Marvel Universe that features magical creatures like goblins, dragons, and zombies. And there are just perpetual battles going on there between gods representing dark and light. It's hard to tell how it ties in with Marvel superheroes, so in the context of the Marvel Multiverse, it's definitely weird and a bit out of place. But it also just seems like a typical medieval fantasy landscape to me. It's almost weirder that this world doesn't really match its name, but I guess... Weird is weird. At number three is the Marvel Apes universe. Featured in the Marvel Apes miniseries, this alternate universe naturally features ape people versions of all the heroes we know and love, and everybody else for that matter. Basically, apes roam the Earth and even the Avengers have changed their name to suit the environment, being widely known as the Ape Avengers. But if you think that's weird, it gets even more bizarre when we learn that Captain America is secretly a vampire who drinks the blood of his enemies. And then eventually it's further revealed that it was never Captain America in the first place, but a Nazi vampire who shapeshifted into Cap years ago after drinking his blood. I honestly don't know what the writers were thinking with this one, but at least it was able to rank high on this list. That's one thing it's got going for itself. At number two is the universe where Aunt May is bitten by the radioactive spider. In a short feature story of What If issue 23, we see what it would be like if Aunt May were to take up the mantle of Spider-Man with web slinging powers and all. And the result is something so bizarre that I've already covered this universe on at least three other lists so far. It just stands out and not necessarily for the right reasons, always. I think they sort of lose me when Aunt May starts using the dough from a bread loaf she's baking as a weapon, but this is one of the best examples of the fun that writers can have with the concept of a multiverse, where basically anything goes as long as it's set in another universe, which is kind of a blessing and a curse for Marvel all at the same time. At least spider May is paired up against Leapfrog, because if she successfully took down any truly reputable villain with her dough lasso, I think I'd have lost a decent chunk of respect for Marvel if I'm being completely honest. At number one is the Larval Earth Universe. In this world, all the Marvel heroes and villains alike have evolved into cute and cuddly animals, with characters like Daredevil, Nick Fury, and the Agents of Sheep. There's no wonder why this universe exists as a one-off, although it may have been just weird enough that it went full circle and became kind of iconic. I mean, the ironically popular Spider-Ham, AKA Peter Porker, also comes out of this alternate universe, so there's that. Larval Earth is probably the weirdest universe to actually be considered part of the official Marvel canon, and with villains like Kangaroo the Conqueror, Sand Manatee, and Magsquito, readers are left wondering whether or not this whole multiverse concept is going too far. But personally, I think the odd, fun, and weird universe never hurt nobody. I mean, who could be mad at Black Panda? I mean, that's not much of a stretch considering he's normally named after an animal, right? Number 10, Gorgon. If you remember the weirdest DC Multiverse Superheroes video, which you should check out, I talked about a pastiche of the Incredible Hulk in DC Comics called Big Baby from Earth 8. He was part of a team called the Retaliators, who were supposed to be a joke version of the Avengers. This universe also had a team of villains called the Extremists. And on that team was a Dr. Octopus type character named Gorgon. While Gorgon did utilize technological enhancements, I think his octopus likeness comes in the form of his prehensile hair. The hair tentacles he uses and his role as a scientist mixed with his weight and oddly familiar glasses all come together to really evoke a Dr. Octopus likeness, which is just weird enough to make me double take. He is also familiar enough that I can't really put him any higher on this list, so there's that. Number nine, Dex Star or Dex Star or Dexter or Dex Star, Dex Star. -er -er. Cats can be ruthless, cold, and scary at times. I'll admit that. But while the Red Lantern of Sector 2814, Dex Star, is an irrationally rage filled kitty, it's all because he loved his owner. Dex Star's origin shows the cat Dexter with his owner when she is attacked by robbers who broke into her home. While Dexter tried his best to scratch the attacker, he ended up ending the life of Dexter's owner. When the police showed up on the scene, Dexter was kicked out into the streets so as to not contaminate the scene. Now, two rascals from the streets found Dexter 
officer when he was trying to sleep, put him in a sack, and threw him into a river. Now that is one hell of a sequence of events. And all this happening filled the poor little kitty with enough rage that it caught the attention of Atrocitus, who called out to him and made him a red lantern. With this newfound power of the red lantern ring, the rage kitty exacted his sweet revenge on the hoodlums and flew to say goodbye to his owner one last time, saying in his little cat language, I find who hurt you, I kill. I good kitty. I love this cat, but I also I also wouldn't dare mess with it ever. Number 8, Prometheus. Heroes and villains with no powers always seem to be some of the most powerful. It's strange. Take Prometheus. After seeing his criminal parents pass at the hands of police, he vows a vendetta on any form of justice. A vendetta that would push him to be able to defeat the whole Justice League single handedly. He shot the Martian Manhunter with a dart that turned his power against him and set him on fire. He infected Steel's armor with a computer virus which commanded the suit to damage the watchtower. He hypnotized the Huntress into unconsciousness. He attacked Green Lantern with a neural chaff that rendered his ring useless. He trapped the angel Zariel in limbo. He tricked the Flash into believing that he had planted motion sensitive devices that would explode if the Flash used his powers. And he defeated Batman in hand to hand combat. That's probably the most nuts thing on this list. His origin is very similar to Batman's. After his parents were dispatched from the mortal plane, he would travel the globe training and becoming the ultimate combat machine. But he also attended the top universities learning as much as he could. He eventually sets up a base in the ghost zone. And from here, he built an armor that could download information on any opponent's fighting style, kind of reminiscent of Taskmaster's ability. He is kind of crazy capable, and his vendetta on any kind of justice plus his Batman likeness just makes him kind of a little strange to me. But also terrifying. Number seven, Earth 17 Superman. On Earth 17, superheroes are a product of government experiments. The Superman of this universe, Overman, was the first, with the other superheroes being spawns of his DNA. Now that may be weird, but that ain't the weird part. He also doesn't really seem like a villain yet, does he? Well, after contracting a disease, a disease, you know, contracting a disease from another person, yes, like that kind of disease, he goes insane and destroys the Justice League and reduces his world to rubble. He then gets his filthy paws on a doomsday boom boom that he intends to use on Earth 17 and wipe it out. The crisis on infinite Earths destroyed this reality just like DC tried to destroy such a naughty Superman story. Even having different iterations of Overmans who were different, like like an Overman who became allied with the Axis powers in World War II. But the internet never forgets DC Comics, and people like me exist to remind everyone of the things you publish into this world. I am sorry, sort of. Thanks for the content. Number 6, Doppelganger. Doppelganger is known for being one of the most vicious and evil spider people out there. He was actually created initially during the Infinity War event by the evil version of Adam Warlock, known as Magus. During that event, many different heroes had to fight against their evil alternate selves or fight against the evil alternate versions of fellow heroes and friends. Doppelganger was one of these, but despite being killed during Infinity War, he still managed to reappear again in the comics, returning in Maximum Carnage and wreaking havoc every time he manages to pretty much pop up. Which happens actually surprisingly often when you consider how many times in different ways he's actually died over the years, but he's still kicking. Number 5, Ghost Spider. I feel like some people are going to be offended by some of the spider folks I'm calling weird on this list, but I would like to take this time to remind you that weird doesn't have to be a bad thing. In fact, weird to me usually tends to be a good thing. Usually weird to me just means something that is extreme or unique in some way. Something that stands out. And standing out, honestly, it can be quite a good thing. In fact, in Spider-Gwen or Ghost Spider's case, I feel like her being weird is a big part of the reason why I love her character and why I think a lot of us love her character. In almost every other universe, Gwen Stacy tragically dies and is actually a huge part of a staple canon event for most Peter Parkers or Spider-Men out there. But in her home reality of Earth-65, things were different. Instead of her dying, it's Peter who becomes the lizard and he dies. And this is surprisingly rare. There are very few realities where Gwen even gets to stay alive. Primarily, I can only think of House of M and Gwenpool's home reality 
off the top of my head. So in the sense of standing out, Ghost Spider truly is a lovable weirdo as the girl that not only lived, but herself also becomes a spider themed hero. Pretty cool. Number 4, Patton Parnell. Patton Parnell is one of my favorite alternate versions of Spider-Man. If you thought Spider's Man was creepy, wait till you meet this guy. Patton Parnell is the Spider-Man of Earth 51412. In this reality, Patton stands in for Peter, but instead of being a good guy, he's kind of just a creepy guy who enjoys making ants burn on the sidewalk with a magnifying glass as part of his experiments. However, Patton is likely a sadistic and creepy person because he actually has a pretty rough home life, often being mistreated by his uncle Ted. In the end, when he receives his powers, they turn him into a monstrous, more evil spider-like creature who ends up mutating into something more monster than man. This version of Spider-Man has only ever made his first and last appearance in Edge of Spider-Verse issue number 4 from 2014. Though honestly, I would love to see more versions of Patton popping up around the world. It's pretty cool. Number 3, Bagman. Bagman is an interesting character. Although many of us consider him to be an alternate thanks to the costume's appearance in events like the Spider-Verse and properties like Marvel's Spider-Man, where this is one of the costumes you can roam around the city in, in the comics, this was only really a moment in Peter's life, at least in the main continuity of Earth 616. Bagman's origins come from the time when Peter went to Reed Richards for help with his black costume, which it turned out was actually the symbiote Venom, and after being separated from the Venom symbiote used this outfit as a temporary replacement costume. It was made up of a fantastic suit loaned to him from Johnny Storm's The Human Torch and a paper bag which had two holes cut out for eyes that he would wear over his head. Big Man's appearance throughout Spider-Verse content however implies that somewhere out there exists a world where Spider-Man never stopped wearing the Big Man outfit. Although we've never visited that world but I would love to. At least I don't think we have. Number 2, Miles Morales Animated Spider-Verse Trilogy. The Miles Morales of Into the Spider-Verse has a somewhat different origin story as we learn in the latest film in the trilogy Across the Spider-Verse. Mild, I would say pretty mild, spoilers ahead for those who have yet to see the film. As that's the Miles we are going to be focusing on here. So we're not focusing on Comic Book 1610. We're going to be focusing on Animated Universe Miles from Earth 1610. The one from Sony's animated multiverse if you will. But at the same time, I'm going to try and keep this more general and avoid getting too specific. So hopefully this will be quite a mild spoiler if you want to listen that won't ruin the movie for you at all. At least that's what I'm hoping. Hope I'm not ruining the movie for anyone. That would make me sad. And across the Spider-Verse, we learn that Miles' origin is actually unique in the sense that it connects him to another reality. This is interesting and unique for his origin story and makes him more of a standout or odd, weird, you might say, character when it comes to the fact that Technically, he could be considered the Spider-Man of a different reality than his native one of Earth 1610. I found that very interesting, and I think it makes him kind of weird in a great way, in an intriguing way. Number one, Bagman. If you thought Bagman was weird, wait till I tell you about Bagman. Yep, you heard that right. You remember Spider-Man? If you aren't familiar with her, a quick recap for you. She is an alternate reality spider themed hero where instead of Peter Parker ending up with spider like powers and abilities after being bitten by a radioactive spider, May Parker, his aunt, receives them instead after she was bitten while delivering a forgotten lunch to Peter while he was on a field trip at school. In this reality, May Parker is the hero known as Spider-Man, with Peter and Ben being part of her crime fighting team and offering her support in terms of techno how and heart. Big Man appears as one of the alternates in the 2019 Spider-Verse comic in issue number 2 that Spider-Man reached out to get help from, reaching across the multiverse in order to defeat an evil alternate version of herself who was actually Carnage, an alternate Carnage and an alternate May Parker. Mm -hmm.